Welcome back. You are listening to Nate the Hate, and I am joined once again by MVG. What's up, Nate? Great to be here. Thanks for having me back. It's always a pleasure to have you here. And today we have two guests because we have a big topic. So first, we're going to welcome in Venture Beats' very own Jeffrey Grubb. Hey, two weeks in a row. <laughs> hey, our fans love having you. So yeah, I love, we love yeah, having you. They've been really nice to me. I've, yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me back. It's always a pleasure to have you here. And we have Microsoft's favorite son, Mr. One Million Gamer Score, Rand Althor. Thanks for having me, Nate. It's a pleasure to be here with MVG and Mr. Jeff Grubb, talking about Grubb Snacks. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it is great for you to join us because we're going to talk about Microsoft and the Xbox Series X and the upcoming July event that is, well, I mean, let's be honest, it's pretty hyped. And part of that hype is because of Phil Spencer. After Sony show aired, he did an interview where he said, hey, I feel good after seeing their show. But his concluding statement was, you know, I think we are in a position where we're, you know, with the games we're going to show and the hardware advantage that we have, I think we're in a very good position. So he feels good about their July event. And now it's dated for July 23rd. What can we expect from Microsoft later this month for them to counter what Sony showed us just a month ago? Because Sony, they showed us a lot of first party games. They showed us a lot of exclusives and they showed some heavy hitters, but they didn't deliver a knockout blow. So what can we expect from Microsoft here to counter what Sony presented? Yeah, I'm out. Yeah, I think it's gonna be a lot of Halo Infinite, right? I think, and I think they have to nail it, right? Yeah, I think they have really, they really have to make that game stand apart. I, I mean, it, 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 you know, three four three hasn't really, uh, hasn't really set itself apart in terms of making Halo games yet, and uh, this is its opportunity. It does, it almost feels beyond an opportunity, right? It feels like this is the make or break moment for whether or not you can turn Halo Infinite into uh, a, a thing that people want to buy a console for. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I, that's, I think that's going to be the big standout. And, and then, you know, we, there's rumors surrounding that. But, I mean, what else do you, what do you, what do you guys think about Halo Infinite? Uh, I mean, Halo's my favorite franchise. Uh, and I've been a little bit disappointed in how 343's handled it uh, with, with their last two games. But I am incredibly excited f- to see what Halo Infinite's going to bring to the table, how it looks on Series X. And, uh, you know, the things that uh, you hear... From people you trust, like it sounds like Halo Infinite is could is, could actually hit the mark, and actually be the game that Halo fans and Xbox fans deserve. So to me, that is going to set the tone for the entire show. It's about Halo. It's about Xbox. But if Microsoft can position Halo as once again not necessarily the king of the mountain, but kind of this is a reason to own or, or, you know, buy into the Xbox ecosystem and it starts with Halo and everything comes from that, then they're going to be in a really good position because Halo's kind of been declining in re- relevancy and popularity over the last, you know, uh, well, mm-hmm. well, this generation, realistically. But if Microsoft and 343 nail that game, nail the presentation with it, I think the excitement around the platform uh, gets you know reinvigorated, and they could essentially start off this gen or upcoming gen on the right foot, uh, in in a way that I I hope happens. But that's just me. Do they open or they do they close with Halo Infinite? Well, I think they're going to open with Phil Spencer mm-hmm. in a Batman costume announcing the Warner <laughs> Brothers Games event, <laughs> <laughs> or one, that they acquired Warner Brothers. No, that's a joke. I I think I think you do open with uh with Halo. Yeah, I think you got to set the tone. Uh, that's gonna game. That's probably the game that's gonna have the most gameplay, and that's uh, Microsoft listening to the criticisms of their May event, where they said there would be gameplay, and there kind of was in small one second, two second bursts, but not really, not like a, a gameplay demo. So I think you probably open with Halo. It's the big game. You show off a nice kind of montage of gameplay footage you know kind of mix it into like a like a hype montage trailer at the end to get everybody pumped about what they're about to see for the rest of the show yeah yeah i, I, I would agree right. i would agree i think i think you got to get the hype hype level maximized in the first you know five or so minutes of the show and what better way to do it than than bring out your, your big guns absolutely agree yeah i mean halo infinite i keep telling people have faith in 343 
And I mean, let's be honest, they really haven't earned that, you know, that benefit of the doubt yet. Halo 5 was wasn't a bad game. It just wasn't really what Halo fans wanted. And Halo Infinite is hopefully that title that, you know, the Halo fans and the Xbox fan base really want from that franchise because I've been disappointed in the Halo games in recent years. And we really don't know much about Halo Infinite at all. We've seen that brief teaser. But, you know, like like Rand said, I have heard some things that it sounds like Halo Infinite is going to be that return to form. It's going to be that evolution that we need from the Halo franchise. And I want them to just bring it. I want them to open the show, have Phil Spencer walk out, give his little introduction, and then you hear that chorus of the Halo music. And we just drop into a hype trailer, give us you know, a good 10 minutes of gameplay, and show us why Halo Infinite is taking advantage of the Xbox Series X hardware, how it's using the SSD, and show us why Halo Infinite is back, why it's a reason we have to buy an Xbox Series X later this year. And if Microsoft can nail that messaging, and the messaging is always where Microsoft seems to stumble a little bit, but if they perfect this with Halo Infinite within those first 15 minutes, they start off the show strong, and you're gonna have people excited because that's where Sony's pacing with the PlayStation 5 show was top notch. It only really kind of hit a slump, probably I'd say midway where they've really focused a lot more on those indie games. But the opening sequence, especially then even to the end, when you have Resident Evil 8, New Ratchet and Clank, Spider-Man, Horizon 2, Demon Souls, that was a lot of quality software. And right now, like even our discussion right now for Microsoft is we're focusing on Halo. So they need a lot more than Halo Infinite to really top or match Sony's presentation and as Grubb reported earlier this week, we are expecting to see Fable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What can we expect from Fable at this show? Uh, so I, I, I think, you know, we've heard this rumor for a while now. Um, uh, this, this is, it, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, the Playground Games, when they started their other studio, they were very upfront that it was about for an open world game, an open world um you know, in the, 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 you know, the subtext there was an open world RPG. And um, I think one of the things Microsoft wants to do going forward um, in starting with an event like this is sort of reclaiming its its history, reclaiming the fact that uh, it has been in games for a while. It, it does have um, it, it does have these properties that people could mm-hmm. get excited about if they're willing to invest in them. Um, and in giving a studio like Playground, which has just nailed Forza Horizon over and over and just really made that series uh, phenomenal, uh, giving them a chance to stretch their legs in a game, in, in, in a kind of a, a series where um, where you could have this sort of uh, triple leg sort of thing that you put in a commercial that people go, oh, wow, that looks that looks incredible. That's on that's on Xbox. OK, um, there's a lot of potential there. Uh, I think that uh, I. I don't know. I'm very excited for this one. I, I don't know exactly what, like, I think they're going to have to mix it up somewhat. I think it's going to have to feel kind of like, like that quad a level game. Um, but I, I, I mean, Microsoft hasn't done one of those in a while. So I'm still kind of curious to see how this one plays out. So fable three is a 10 year old game and us, us kind of older, older folk, you know, we love the fable franchise, but <laughs> how's Microsoft going to make this appeal to a newer generation of game player because it's very easy to get caught in the the fable that's kind of familiar to us but some of those mechanics hasn't haven't really i'll say age particularly well and so do you think that you know they're very cognizant of that and they're really going to bring a i'll say a new flavor on the fable franchise that we know i i think I think it's going to be a reboot and it's essentially going to be a new IP set in the Fable universe. It's going to be Playgrounds Fable and it really won't bear much resemblance to Lionhead's Fable. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. it's going to be taking direct uh, you know, influence from uh, CD Projekt Red's Witcher 3 and her, you know, Sony's Horizon Zero Dawn. Like I think that is the template that they're going to go for. It'll be set in Albion uh, they, they there'll be like some lore that's based in that universe, but I sincerely doubt there'll be a button dedicated to kicking chickens and farting <laughs> and having that kind of cheeky British humor. That's st- the cheeky British humor st- thing still might be there, but I expect this to be a more uh, realistic approach to fable 
And since we kind of started out this discussion about what Microsoft is going to, you know, open the show with Halo Infinite, I'll throw it out there that I think Fable ends the show. I think yeah, that, that that's, makes how, sense. that's how they end it with this kind of, it is an open seeker, right? Like everybody expects them to reveal Fable. I don't like, and that would be a way to, to end the show. Like here's a look at Fable, which I don't think we'll see gameplay. I think it'll be a very much a announcement trailer hmm. in the vein of Hellblade 2 at the VGAs. It's rumored mm-hmm. to be on Unreal Engine 4, probably on Unreal Engine 5, whenever it does launch, which I think is probably around 2022. But, I mean, Playground Games, the only question for me with them is, since they are masterclass developers of, of the racing genre, like, they do- they've they dominated that field uh, for, you know, th- this whole generation, right? I don't think anybody even compares to them anymore. Like, they're so far beyond everybody else. The question for me is like, can that translate into an open world RPG? Because it's completely different. Um, but I, I think Playground's going to nail this, and I think when people see what they're doing with that franchise, uh, like MV, MVG said, like we're, I mean, I, I, I like the Fable franchise, but it's been ten years. A lot of people don't even know what Fable is anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, but I think this is Microsoft's opportunity to bring that series back to light, and. I, I think that is going to be the linchpin. You're going to have Halo starting it off and Fable ending it, and that'll be like the kind of two big things, the two big games that Xbox fans will like carry forward into uh, the future. Yeah, because Fable was a big franchise on the original Xbox. I mean, it was Peter Molyneux's baby. He hyped it up in all the wrong ways where he promised us that we could plant an acorn and it would we come back 10 years later, it'd be a tree or you could kill a boy's father. And when you came back years later, the boy would remember you and seek revenge. None of that happened. So if we move away from, you know, all those overhyped nonsensical promises and they do go that Witcher three more realistic, but still in the fantasy world, whimsicalness. And it's set in Albion. I mean, this is, can be the rebirth of fable in that mature, cool sense that we've expected from like these fran- like these fantasy franchises now because the witcher 3 really changed things for that genre as a whole it set a new standard mm-hmm. and if fable can match that or even exceed that i mean this this is exactly the direction microsoft needs to go they need to reclaim their roots from the original xbox where they developed a lot of new ip they developed a lot of software because they didn't rely purely on third parties they were willing to look internally and craft a lot of games, but they also looked to Japan for some third-party exclusives like Ninja Gaiden Black and such. And we've kind of seen Phil Spencer focus a little more on that Japanese market, especially in recent months. They have the Yakuza games on Game Pass. We have the Kingdom Hearts games. Final Fantasy mainline titles are coming to Game Pass soon. And it just feels like Microsoft is now focused. And it's kind of a new Microsoft. The Xbox One was originally led by Don Matrick, and it was a disaster in messaging and marketing. Oh, really? That's weird. (laughs) I didn't hear that. (laughs) No, you know, it kind of flew into some people's radar. Yeah. (laughs) But, like, Phil Spencer just seems he's so focused on a single goal, and that goal is we need software to convince consumers to come to our ecosystem, and that ecosystem is either you're buying an Xbox box or you're buying our software on PC. And I mean, congratulations to Phil, if he's able to, you know, really navigate this well, deliver a concise marketing message, which so far they have aside from that totally miscalculated May event where they promised next gen gameplay and showed us a bunch of trailers and very little gameplay. Microsoft seems to be on a very good heading with their, you know, marketing message. But aside from Fable and Halo, what other surprises could we expect from Microsoft at this event in terms of software? Because we had reports last week from VGC.com, and they said that the initiative was going to show their game. And this week, very own Jeffrey Grubb came out and said, nah, That's the initiative bullshit. Game. After, after watching my video, <laughs> after watching my video, he wrote, he wrote the article on it. <laughs> wow. Where I said that Perfect Dark was probably not going to be at the show. I'm I'm just gonna let you ghostwrite all my stuff from now on. You gotta get get the you shouldn't even be on this podcast. Get the work for my stuff tomorrow. Sounds good, man. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's yeah. It's not the um, the initiative is like is is Microsoft's big new um, statement studio, right? It is that this mm-hmm. studio 
uh, it, it got founded in Santa Monica, you know, right where Sony has a, a big studio, uh, right in that region where there's a lot of like big of the biggest AAA uh, developers in the world. And by putting a studio there, Microsoft was saying we are absolutely going to try to make those quad A level games, and, and and it needs those games, right? That's why we keep talking. We start with Halo, and we say how important it is for the, for them to nail that, and we talk about Fable and how it needs to be a lot more like Sony's games. And, and really what we're saying there is these games need to be big and expensive and they need to like look very slick and very polished. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the initiative is, is certainly working on a game like that. Um, a, a lot of the rumors point to it being perfect dark, but if you're getting your hopes up because of uh, some rumors saying it's gonna be at this July event, I, I, what I've heard it was never supposed to be there and it's not, and it's it's definitely not going to be there at this point. Uh, that's that's the, the latest plan. So. Uh, yeah, so that's the surprise that's like kind of off the table. Um, but I, I don't know. Were, were you guys kind of hoping to see that? I mean, I know I'm I'm definitely very excited about it. But what are you guys thinking? Well, to, to be fair, Jeff, I I, I didn't um, I didn't say that it wasn't going to be there because you know the time of the timing. I, I just kind of felt like Perfect Dark seems like a bit of a pipe dream more than anything, you know. And and I kind of assumed that whatever this game will be, it's it's not perfect dark but it may be something very similar to perfect dark if that makes sense yeah. because again i i think back i think back to these franchises perfect dark zero released 15 years ago and again i'm a big fan of perfect dark but those games haven't aged very well perfect dark zero yeah. is is kind of a bit of a dog's breakfast to be <laughs> to be totally honest with you uh the original perfect dark is a fantastic game but it's it's how good is it in in 2020 so I, I wonder if, if it's truly a Perfect Dark, we'll say a Perfect Dark 3 or a sequel to Perfect Dark Zero, or if it's a a similar style of game to Perfect Dark, um, which is kind of my point. And I, I think the initiative is probably doing something along those lines versus just a you know sequel to Perfect Dark Zero. Yeah, I think it maybe is a touchstone, right? Like, yeah, you you say, uh, you know, even if it is like um, it takes place in the same universe or something like that. I agree yeah. with all that. I, I I don't know if it's Perfect Dark or not. I don't. I know those are the rumors. I, I would be very surprised if it came out and it was like this is Perfect Dark three. That would be very weird to me. Um, or even a, like a strict reboot, like the Perfect Dark. Yeah, uh, that would be kind of absurd too. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, again, I I do think Microsoft wants to, uh, like I said, uh, kind of uh, reclaim its history here. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is one way to do that. Like, yeah, the, the, the Perfect Dark Nintendo 64 did, it hasn't aged well because none of those first person shooters did. And Perfect Dark uh, Zero was, was trash. It wasn't a good game. Um, and and so, like the way that you build out of that and say like, this is still a franchise that people have some fondness for uh, is, you know, you move forward with it and, and, and you try to uh, build its future, uh, you know, starting fresh in a way. But again, I don't know for sure. But yeah, I, cl- clearly the timing, it, it doesn't make sense, right? This is a studio that that was like they announced it in at E3 2018 or around that time. Um, and they were hiring all through 2019 uh, mm-hmm. for like very, like very key roles where where it would it would be surprising to me if they were able to get something uh, even ready to show by this point in 2020 um it, it doesn't mean they don't have something I, I think i'm sure that they've that they're you know sending stuff to phil spencer all the time saying hey look at how good this is coming together um and and, it, and i still don't that doesn't necessarily mean it's not going to show up at all anytime soon um they, they're going to have other events and if this game is ready to like tease they're, they'll, they'll have it for that they have to like counter sony if sony comes back in august and has a bunch of surprises that they held back uh this is something that that microsoft could still play um, but, but even even in that case, like no one's thinking this game's coming out like in 2021, right? Like n- n- none of, none of you guys think that, right? No, 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 of course not. <laughs> of course not. It'd be 2022, more likely probably 2023. I'm just interested in seeing what they're making. Like this seems like a studio designed to be like, hey, make us a game that Sony makes, and we're gonna build you the studio <laughs> right in between Naughty Dog and Sony Santa Monica. You can poach their talent, yep. right? And it seems like every and th- that's essentially what they did. So you can. You can make assumptions based on the people they hired that it's going to be third person. Uh, you know, like the rumors point to being Perfect Dark. Maybe jo- maybe it's called Joanna Dark and it's not exactly Perfect Dark or it's something else. But it sounds like it's a third person stealth game, which is great because Ubisoft won't give us a Splinter Cell. Uh, so I'll take mm-hmm. a stealth game anywhere, anywhere I can get it. Um, it's interesting, though, because Matt Booty said in um, when they revealed the, the Xbox Series X at the VGAs, uh, he had uh, was talking to the Game Informer guys, and the, he basically told them, you will see the Initiative's game in 2020. 
Now, of course, that was before COVID and the current pandemic, and obviously things have changed, right? Like, I remember when Mr. Grubb was loved by Risa Dare, then hated by Risa Dare when Sony didn't do anything, and then loved again when he got it right, you remember? Because <laughs> plans are always fluid about certain mm-hmm. things. Um, and the, the, the fickle crew over there, yeah. Yeah, very, very fickle. So... I, I obviously made plans could change. Maybe it was supposed to be at the July show. You said it was never supposed to be there. That's obviously a possibility. But you did kind of mention uh, when what you just said, and also like in your articles and tweets, that like the rumor is Sony's going to go in August again. That they held stuff back, right? Possibly, like yeah. the rumored yeah. Silent Hill, maybe some other first party things, and that also Microsoft was supposed to reveal Lockhart in August. They didn't do that, and now they're going to reveal Lockhart in. But and, yeah, they were going to do it in June, June and yeah. now reveal in August. And if Sony does somehow come with some huge announcements in early August or whenever they would do it, does that mean Microsoft can then be like, okay, we were we we kind of like held off on the initiative and we're going to reveal Lockhart and pricing. And when we reveal pricing, we're also going to show you this quadruple A uh, uh, studio what they're working on to go along with here's Lockhart here's the price and here's this huge new game that we're also working on to kind of counteract that I, all of that yeah, all of that makes sense right like I think that is a possibility if they if they feel the need to do that I, I think right now the plan is is to hold it off for kind of quite a bit later in the year uh if, if they're going to show it this year and, and yeah I know people point to that Matt Booty quote and I think that um I, you know uh, I think the game is in a state where if they had to show it, they could. And yeah. I think him, him when he said that, I think he's probably thinking like, well, yeah, that's of course we're going to show that like it's uh, like, uh, you know, five or six months from now. Yeah, I mean, um, technically they could they could show it at the Game Awards, right, right at the end of the year, right? You know? And it would something like be- that. That there's XOs, XO, and you yep. know, whatever twenty or whatever that, that stuff's still going to happen at some point. Um, that those are these are all, uh, and I think th- those are the things that are in the conversation right now. These things, uh, you know, as you said, still very fluid. They uh, they, um, they have their cards. They're going to figure out where to play play them uh, as they need to, and, and all of that is going to just keep changing going forward. But I think the the, the the, the game plan that you laid out there is is perfectly viable. That is absolutely something that could happen. Mm-hmm. I see, like Sony, they showed a really strong hand in June. Microsoft, so far we're building a good deck, but we really don't have a, a super strong hand yet. Out of these games, do we expect all of them to show up or maybe just a few? Do, we, do you think we see rares ever wild? Yes. 100 percent. yes uh, i don't know in what in what type of fashion we see it whether it's just another trailer or it's maybe some gameplay but i i would expect to see everwild at the show do we see hellblade 2 with gameplay yes 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 we do i, I think ninja theory is an integral part of this show and i would ex- again i would expect to see more of hellblade 2 that that initial trailer from the game awards i mean it's been it's been watched so many times you know people are kind of sick of it even though it's technically brilliant i think it's time to see some more of that game do we see project mara no Mm. i don't think so okay do we see forza motorsport 8 i'll let i think we see a forza i think we see a forza it's very interesting what they do with this because if you assume they show Forza Motorsport 8, which I think isn't hitting this year, or I don't think a Forza game's hitting this year, period, mm-hmm. uh, and they move the Forza series into a spring launch because Microsoft really kind of wants to... They don't want... They used to, especially during this gen, kind of backload their, their games release, right? Like, end of mm-hmm. the year, they would release everything. But Game Pass kind of changes that because you need people to stay subscribed, so you need games launching kind of all the time and the i I think forza comes out um spring 2021 that'd be a good time for it the question i always have is which forza is it is it motorsport 8 or is it horizon 5 because playground's been on a two-year cycle for horizon for since you know they did the very first one and they would essentially be on deck for this year like forza horizon 5 would be hitting holiday 2020 but Turn 10 skipped last year because they needed more time for Forza Motorsport 8. So if you think, it, well, maybe Forza Motorsport 8 comes out spring next year, that implies that that Horizon can't come out in 2021, which means, okay, then Horizon maybe comes out in 2022, 
and that would be a four year gap from Forza Horizon 4. Um, I don't really know what to expect here, to be honest with you. Like, I can see Horizon <laughs> 5 launching this year, but then I could easily just see Motorsport 8 launching in spring or Horizon 5 launching in spring. Like, I, mm-hmm. it's, it's very interesting because whatever happens, if one, if, if the Forza game comes out in 2021, you can't, you won't see the other one until 2022. And that would, that would, you know, say turn 10 got a, a large amount of time to make that Forza Motorsport 8 or Playground got a large amount of extra time to make the next Forza Horizon. You know, I yeah, think, I think it's, I mean, I get, you know, the, the, the cycles, but I'm kind of treating this Rand very similar to when the original Xbox one VCR came out, you had that Forza Motorsport game. Was it five? I think it was five, yeah. uh, five yeah. was, 10, was 1080p, yeah. 60 frames. I, I think that it's going to be a motorsport game, uh, which will, you know, it's, it's going to be one of those, uh, one of those statement games that really show off the power of the system, very similar to the last, last go around. So I, I would expect it to be a motorsport game personally. Do you think you think it comes? You think it launches like with the system? Oh no, and no, Halo Infinite? definitely not. No, I think I think um, what we'll see is probably <laughs> turn ten. Um, you know, I think it'll be a bit of a technical uh, showcase of of what they're doing with Forza. Um, they'll they'll show you know some of the some of the cool kind of aesthetics, uh, sixty frames or maybe one hundred and twenty hertz ray tracing. Really, just kind of show you what they're working on and, and stay tuned because we've got more Forza coming. You know early next year or something like that but it's definitely not launching with with the game uh, with the system sorry so what about do we see obsidian come out with a show a new ip at the, i hope at, so i i really i think um i think that's the biggest chance for like a big unknown surprise um and i it, so it, it's it's tough but i think like if you're phil spencer and you're saying like that you're really confident in this show it's because you have something like that you have something that people aren't expecting that you know looks fantastic and we and that's kind of been uh, the, the rumor going around about what, what obsidian is working on for its for its triple a game for its return to triple a um uh, so yeah I'm, I'm hopeful but i'm not like com- i'm not completely convinced uh so i I'd kind of put it like 60 40 that it does show up because <laughs> that's that's the thing why i think about the two shows you can look at sony's show you say okay they brought a lot of their they brought a nice range of first party ip from Spider-Man to Ratchet and Clank to Horizon. And when we just talk about Microsoft, we still say, you know, Halo. And now we have, mm-hmm. you know, we throw Fable into the mix and we throw Forza into the mix. And these are all respective franchises in their own right. It just feels like Sony's IP are bigger juggernauts, Halo aside. I mean, Halo is still a gigantic franchise. It still has a legion of fans. It just needs to kind of prove itself. What can we see from Microsoft first party wise, aside from the titles we've already mentioned, that really just hammers in a major blow that solidifies the Xbox Series X or the Xbox ecosystem as, you know, that really exciting platform for 2020 and beyond? Flight simulator. <laughs> okay, that's that's me. I, as long as Flight Simulator shows up and looks awesome, like it has been, I'll be happy. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I think it's a, about variety at this point, right? Like I think if uh, all the games we talked about, um, if they come out and they look good, if, um, if Fable looks fantastic, if the Obsidian game does show up, I think at that point, like okay, they really have these like huge pillars. Uh, what do you have to like to fill it in? To like uh, one of the things about the Sony event is that it was it was quite varied. There was a lot of different stuff. There was yes, uh, yeah. There, there's Horizon, but there's also Ratchet. And so like the Psychonauts two come back and like look like oh now it has Microsoft money. That that's the kind of thing that I'm like okay now I'm actually like okay there's a lot of different stuff here and now I'm getting really excited. That's where I I question whether they have enough to counter Sony. Um, but I will say this. I can't help but feeling there's there's something that we none of us know about that's that's mm. going to get unveiled. You know, there's I, I don't want to say it's the one more thing type of type of you know um, presentation, but I feel like there's an IP that that none of us are, are, are aware of that's coming that will really you know make the show a lot a lot sweeter than than what we think it's going to be. Oh, and VG's talking about blinks again. <laughs> I, dude, oh. I hope so. I love blinks. <laughs> Blinks, Blinks, awesome. Blinks and sneakers, <laughs> that quality Xbox mouse game. Now, well, there, there there could be like stuff from Xbox Global Publishing. Right. Uh, they've been uh-huh. pretty quiet. Now you look at what they did this gen. Uh, they brought us like 
stuff like Rise and Sunset Overdrive, uh, things like Ori, you know, stuff that was outside of the first party. And we obviously you can't even really kind of predict what they could be. Like we can say, oh, Obsidian might be working on this or Perfect Dark might be by the initiative, Fable by uh, Playground Games. But we know that global publishing has deals. We just you don't know what it is. And it could be some of those surprises. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's just not very many games out there right right now for them to go buy. Like, um, I think it's been Google's problem with Stadia. Is like they want to like uh, go 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 out to these third parties and get some partnerships and bring some games to Stadia. And like, there's just there's just not much out there that isn't already claimed. Um, and maybe that's because Microsoft has already started making those deals. And I think um, Nate, you were you were talking about like uh, Microsoft um, and Phil focusing on on Japan. And I think a big part of that is uh, Japanese studios are maybe not so certain about their future just because of the way the PlayStation 4 sold. And, and the, yeah, they, they know that the Switch is going to continue to sell and, and, and they'll have a home on Nintendo. But uh, they've gotten really good at making... Uh, a, a lot of Japanese studios have gotten really good at making the biggest budget, budget games that like are technically sound and and just have this global appeal. Uh, and are they going to have a console to continue selling that stuff on? And, and Microsoft trying to make a case that that's going to be a, a home for them as well uh, could give them confidence to not all retreat to mobile games or whatever. So yeah, that, I think there, I hope there's something like that from from you know Xbox Global. Yeah, that definitely be exciting to see if maybe Microsoft could have courted. You know something from the Japanese developers because we did see Sony they got Capcom to exclusively reveal Resident Evil 8 at their show so you know what we'll move into is what can we expect from maybe a surprise third-party announcement like because Sony had Resident Evil 3 uh, Resident Evil 8 what could we expect from Microsoft in terms of like that shocking third-party announcement it doesn't have to be exclusive like we know they'll probably show us Assassin's Creed Valhalla again after the botched showing in May but could Call of Duty maybe finally get announced at Microsoft's showing? No. Or <laughs> no, yeah, Sony I, is sitting on that one. <laughs> yeah, if I put that in my story, just kind of like a. Eh. But no, <laughs> there's. It's definitely not going to be at the Xbox thing. Um, that's uh, that's still. I'm, I'm pretty sure Sony still has that deal. It makes sense just based on the uh, the, the the years it's been since they started that deal. Uh, it probably wouldn't have expired by now. But yeah, look, from what I've heard, definitely not at Xbox. Um, but I mean, I don't know. When I look at other third party. Thing. I, I don't know. It's it's always tough. I'm always uh, I always wonder like how Phil feels about that after the Tomb Raider thing, where they, when when they went out and got the uh, Tomb Raider timed exclusive stuff. I wonder like uh, is that something he? I, you know, I know you said not just exclusive, but is that something uh, he even wants to like kind of trend close to? Um, I'm I'm not sure. So it's, it's I'm still kind of confused about what they could do there. What yeah, about that's... um? What about Coalition? You know, we know Gears of War uh, Five or Gears Five is oh. coming. You know. Um, for the Series X with enhancements, but is there going to be a tease of the next Gears game? Because I, I kind of put down that, that there would be something. Seems way too early for that right now. Not even yeah. just a, a, a little clip of um, Marcus, you know, uh, with with his uh, with his gun or something, you know, doing a doing a spin and, and looking into the camera and then cut, fade into black or something. <laughs> I, Nothing. I think you won me over. I'm convinced now. <laughs> I think the most we get if we see a Gears at this, it would just be them saying, oh, Xbox Series X at launch, you're going to get Gears Tactics. It's going to be on Game Pass, and you get like a five-second trailer of that. Because does anyone remember that game came out on PC this year? Yeah, I, I liked it enough. <laughs> well, now, it's, it's like speaking of Game Pass, because Grub, you did mention in your article the potential of Cyberpunk. Yeah, maybe right. Game Pass. What so, type of Game Pass type deals could we see Microsoft announce at their event? And if it is Cyberpunk, what type of precedent does that set for the like the Game Pass initiative moving forward? So I I, I think this is like where I was going with that last point where mm -hmm. um I, Microsoft does have money it wants to send, spend. We saw Sony spending money to get uh, timed exclusives from third parties. Um, and, and that's never been something that has really moved the needle for uh, Microsoft and Xbox. And, 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 it, and it's a, the kind of thing that doesn't move the needle in the direction Microsoft cares about anymore anyway. What do they care about? They want people on Game Pass. And spending that money to in, instead of getting timed exclusive to just put a third party game on Game Pass up front when it's still available everywhere else for 60 bucks, to me, that just screams like 
such a good idea to the point where um, if you could do that with cyberpunk, doesn't that just change everything for everybody? Like, like if you are someone sitting there with $500, $600 trying to figure out what system to get uh, and you don't have a PC, which is, you know, if you have a PC to play games, you already have an Xbox, just go get Game Pass that way. Uh, but, you know, if you're trying to figure that out and you're like looking uh, at the, the landscape of how you're going to be buying video games and you see video games moving up to $70 maybe from certain publishers, uh, the the obvious deal here is like if Microsoft is going to do this with Cyberpunk and they're kind of uh, you know tacitly uh, uh, planning to do that in the future, they're kind of suggesting that this is something that's going to continue to happen even beyond Microsoft first party games. To me, that just is like, OK, that is such a compelling case. That is such a good use of your Microsoft first party money uh, that I'm like, OK, let's I'm, I'm bought in. Just keep doing that. Let's make it happen. <laughs> Yeah, and it really feels like if they announce that in July that Cyberpunk is going to be on Game Pass at launch for the Xbox Series X, that's really an announcement that Sony can't counter. Mm -hmm. They can't come out and say, oh, well, we're going to have this on PlayStation Plus. Like, you're not going to have that type of tier game on PlayStation Plus during the launch month of PlayStation 5. And if Microsoft can secure more of those deals with third-party developers, especially within these first... We'll say the first year because it looks like Microsoft's first party offerings might be a little light within the opening 12 months. But if they can come out with more of the cyberpunk type deals, let's say they add Grand Theft Auto V to Game Pass for Xbox Series X. It's already on there right now for the Xbox One. But well, I mean, they actually kinda, remo they removed it for they Grand Theft Auto. It. Yeah, they, they replaced it with uh, Red Dead Redemption. But it, right. as for uh, the Game Pass thing, I think is interesting because. In my opinion, it's taken a step back this year. There haven't been as many uh, bigger games that they put into the service like they did last year. And a lot of the games that they had marketing for uh, haven't hit yet, right? So mm -hmm. I look at what they did last year when E3, when the E3 show happened. Like, if you remember, they got up on stage, they announced the PC beta for, for Game Pass on PC. And they they added like 30 games all at once, and they made some some big announcements about games being there. So I think, you know, if this showing is all about game showcase and it's all about the future of Xbox and Series X and stuff, what better way to come in there and be like, hey, Cyberpunk's going to be there, whether or not it's day one is anybody's guess. It would be absolutely monstrous if it was. But like, all right, Doom Eternal is going to be there. Uh, you know, like something like Mortal Kombat 11. Right, some of these games that Microsoft had marketing for, uh, that if you go back and look, like uh, from like last year where they had marketing for Devil May Cry Five and Just Cause Four and Metro Exodus, they all end they all ended up joining Game Pass pretty soon, and Microsoft had marketing for all these games, and I always kind of look at like, well, maybe that's kind of a thing they work out with their partners. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see like an announcement or a montage of games coming to game pass around the launch of series X, like doom eternal, mortal Kombat 11 and games like that, that also have the, the, the enhancements for it, like doom eternal at 120 frames, 4k and things like that to give people <laughs> even a more reason to upgrade to that system, you know? Right. And I mean, that's where Microsoft can really leverage game pass in such a significant way. And due to their approach to backwards compatibility, Game Pass is even more essential to that equation because they've said, we're looking at original Xbox games where we can add HDR. We're looking at Xbox 360 games where we can take them from 60 frames a second to 120, or we can increase the resolution because we've seen with like Ninja Gaiden Black, it's 4K on the Xbox Series X or the Xbox One X. So if they can do that to a wider range of software and you have those on Game Pass or they're part of just your backwards compatibility plans, they really launch with a much larger base of software than one would really anticipate. Like, I haven't played Doom Eternal yet, but if they say they're adding that to Game Pass and I can get it at 4K, 120 frames a second on the Xbox Series X, that's almost a system seller in its own way because, I mean, Game Pass is, you know, it's affordable. And again, I can just buy the system for $500. I don't have to buy Doom Eternal for $60. I just download it on Game Pass. I get all those benefits, and it's basically an entirely new experience. At the same time, I'm getting access to Halo, possibly Cyberpunk, the Medium, and so many other games. Like Game Pass is definitely Microsoft's focus. But is it, I guess, is it enough of a focus? Like, are we going to see them focus on it a lot 
at this event where they really position it as we just want you in the Game Pass ecosystem one way or the other. We don't care if you buy the Xbox or if you play on PC. Well, I think. Yeah. yeah go ahead, Jeff. Uh, yeah, I would, say, I would just say, yes, they're going to that's that'll be still their focus. I think um, every chance that they get to say that this game is on Game Pass, that'll be the first thing, it, you know, they're they're they're, tr- they're still trying to sell consoles. They are still going to try to get you hyped up. They're going to say all the reasons why this game is so good on Xbox Series X. Absolutely, but that they, I still think that above that in the hierarchy of what is important to them, it's still going to be Game Pass. They like mm-hmm. you know I've, I've said it already. Like if you have if, if the reason you're not buying an Xbox Series X is because you have a PC that plays games, you already own an Xbox. That is literally the thing that you're saying because you're just like I'll just buy it. On the, on the Xbox, I basically already have. And so <laughs> to, to them, that's music to their ears. They, that, then the next step is is to get you to not necessarily buy games on Steam, which they don't hate if you do that. They really don't care that much. But if, if you <laughs> then say, instead of spending $60 there, I'll just go get Game Pass on PC, that's even better. That's so much better. So uh, yeah, that's the, every chance they get, they will, they'll be harping and hammering this message of get on Game Pass. Like that was the... Um, uh, the internal memo from Phil, from Phil Spencer that I saw last E3 was that that was basically it. He's like that we are going to be saying every chance we get why you should be on Game Pass, and that was his message to all his employees, and that hasn't changed. So yeah, absolutely. So when Sony, so I guess- when Sony had their their presentation, they opened up the show announcing that Grand Theft Auto Five was was coming to the PlayStation Five. We know about mm-hmm. Gears of War or Gears Five. Um, you know, is there going to be another announcement where a current generation Xbox game gets kind of pushed, or even a third party game gets pushed to to the next generation, and it's actually part of this announcement? Um, I mean, Microsoft's been pretty vocal about their smart delivery initiative for all those games. I'm, I mean, Grand Theft Auto Five is probably the biggest current gen game that could go next gen with improvements and such because the game just makes it makes so much money for Rockstar. What if they counter with Oblivion? Oh god. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to see Oblivion or Skyrim or anything like that at this show. I mean, I guess if you're Microsoft, maybe you try to have the first showing of something like Fortnite. Yeah. That's what I was kind of getting at. Um you know, it, it, maybe there's there's a possibility that they could they could bring I'll say one of those um online style games that's quite popular to play yeah, battle royale style game like yeah. fortnite because we had i mean epic said they're going to bring over fortnite to unreal engine 5 starting next year so i guess they could do like a first glimpse at the microsoft show later this month if they really feel that you know felt that need but, i mean i feel like microsoft's focus is really going to be kind of more on the microsoft side of the xbox thing yeah like as rob mentioned in his article what if there's that possibility that Microsoft does come out on stage and Phil Spencer does say, we are getting rid of Xbox Live. We're making multiplayer free again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, Xbox Live Gold specifically, yeah. Yeah. like That's an announcement that Sony can't come out and they can't counter that at a state of play in August. Yeah. Because Sony's not going to abandon the PlayStation Plus initiative anytime soon. It makes them a lot of money. And I mean, they give away those free games to justify basically its existence of charging us $60 a year to play online gaming. If Microsoft comes out and says, we're getting rid of Xbox Live Gold, I mean, to consumers, that is a consumer friendly announcement. That's huge. That's game changing. It's overdue, a- right? Like they should have yeah. done this a while ago. It, it, it's, um, uh, I think I think you still need Xbox Live Gold to play many free to play games like like Fortnite on Xbox, right? Is that still the case? I know that was the case though for a while. Yes, yeah, for some of them you still do. Yeah, and it's like okay, I mean, you need to get that figured out because mm-hmm. I, you that that barrier is such a, a problem for if you're going to come out with something like Lockhart and say that this is a um, a, a more affordable system that is uh, geared at families that still like put all their games on the 1080p in the uh, TV in the basement uh, for the kids. Um, and now they go to hook it up and it's like, oh, I need this Xbox Live Gold thing just so they can play Fortnite. That is that this is such a you're right. That is such a hurdle for so many people um, announcing the fact that you're getting rid of that, which, you know, and, and, and I'm not saying Xbox Live Gold still does make a lot of money for Microsoft. It, it, it absolutely does. I, you know, I just got charged for my Xbox Live Ultimate uh, today for the first time uh, since that one dollar deal. Um, and, and, you know, so I paid the full fifteen dollars for for Ultimate because, you know, I still need gold. Um, but. The running out of games 
to give away for free, which Microsoft does as well. Um, and 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 games like Fortnite make them so much more money just from like getting cuts of those sales that it's like if you could just focus on that and focus on encouraging people to play on your system and and buying stuff there, that seems like maybe the better long term solution to this. And, and so yeah, um, I, I think that's probably. I think that's probably happening, and I would would not be surprised if it gets announced in the July event for sure. Do you, you think that would be their non software related big announcement? Because we're not really expecting much in terms of like hardware announcements at at this event. Like we're not going right. to get pricing, we're not going to get a release window. So that that could be positioned as their non software huge announcement, because like we've talked about a lot of you know broad range of software here, and aside from still like aside from Halo and Fable. I don't feel like any of the software we've mentioned is that megaton moment that you know is an equivalent to what Sony had presented at their show. It still feels like Microsoft's show is lacking in some way. And I don't know if it's just me or maybe if you guys agree with that. I I Yeah, go ahead. It's it, it depends how you how you kind of look at look at it. I mean, in one way, Nate, if you say that they'll they'll have Halo, which mm-hmm. is the star of the show, plus Fable plus some form of Forza Motorsport 8 plus Ninja Theories uh, Hellblade 2 in some in some form all of a sudden you know that doesn't sound that it's starting to sound pretty good right I mean we're starting to build yeah it's I, I agree with you it's not it's not at the same level as maybe the Sony presentation but now all of a sudden if you throw in like you said um, we start talking about Game Pass, and maybe they they announced that Cyberpunk will be will be available on on Game Pass, you know, day one. You know the 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 people that are kind of upset about the seventy dollars price of, of next generation games. I mean, you've already starting to appeal to those people, right? You talk about smart mm-hmm. delivery, so I think it's going to be a you know Microsoft's going to attack from from different angles. You know, they're going to come in from 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 different kind of vantage points and really try to get get you hooked on on their system. So I, I agree. I don't necessarily think that they have the games to to back up what what uh, what Sony had, but they're pretty close. And I also yeah. feel like there is, like I said previously, and I, and trust me, I don't know anything, that there is an, an announcement coming that none of us know about. Like there, there's something they got up their sleeve, you know, and I, I hope, I hopefully that that is the case. And if that's, if that announcement is, is something that gets us, is, is surprising to us and gets us excited, then I think they're just about there. So I, I, I would, you know, if, if Phil is quietly confident right now about the show, then I kind of, you know, I believe him. I'm, I'm kind of on, on board with it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not even necessarily, um, you know, I talk about this from a, a more um, like a pulled out aspect where I'm thinking about oh, what do people want? But if I like talk about the things that like I care about, like most most Sony first party games don't appeal to me when I try to play them and most of them don't click. I bounce off most. I like I like Spider-Man. I, I did not like God of War and uh, not really i'm like i was happy to just put down last of us after seven or eight hours um and so like microsoft trying to bring out games that are like going to be more like sony games uh i get the strategy there but that's not exciting mm-hmm. to me i'm mm-hmm. much more i'm much more interested in the weird games they're going to put on game pass put uh, uh you know they put mud runner on there i'll play that you know i'll put, put snow runner on there and i'm like yeah i'll play that on, a, on an xbox of course i will um so but but if we're talking about like them just trying to you know match the intensity of the best sort of Sony E3 shows from the last uh, half decade or whatever, mm-hmm. um, I, I don't I don't think anything's really going to live up to like the the most exciting one of those shows. Uh, I, I, and and you know this last one from them, uh, the, the, their their PlayStation Five reveal um, was was pretty good. I think that so I think Microsoft is going to get pretty close. I think most people are going to come away pretty happy. At least that you know that's my, that's my hunch, and I agree. With MVG saying that there's something we don't know about, I think if that if they can really surprise us with the games, it'll be close enough, and then everyone's gonna like for like for for months people are gonna be talking about anything that they might do with like getting rid of uh, Xbox Live Gold and adding big game, big third party games to, uh, to to Game Pass. That'll be the stuff that really carries them forward because that's the stuff that's actually going to be uh, where they can really hurt Sony, and Sony's gonna have a hard time fighting back. Yeah, I would agree with that. It does seem like they're going to have a solid software showcase. And if they are able to mix in those Game Pass announcements of like a Cyberpunk and some other major third-party deals that 
the games will be coming to Game Pass, you know, within a reasonable window from launch or if not launch a day. And then they do come out and say, we're getting rid of Xbox Live Gold. It paints them as an overall product, probably in a better light than what Sony came out with the PS5. And that's not a knock on Sony or the PlayStation 5 presentation. They showed quality software. They showed the hardware. It was exactly what Sony needed. But if Microsoft can really one-up them by showing the strengths of Game Pass, getting rid of that Xbox Live Gold requirement, it pushes their conference kind of into an entirely different direction of we're all about the consumer. You're worried about $70 games? Well, we might have those on Game Pass. You're worried about the price to play online? We're removing that. We're all about making gaming better for you. Just come join us. And we have this great piece of hardware you can buy at your home if you don't want to play on PC. And here's a, you know, here's that wide range of software from Halo to Fable. It just feels like they're missing that that one piece. And maybe Perfect Dark would have been it of just that wow factor of like they really are you you know, they're utilizing those IP in their catalog to their strengths. They're finally listening to us because one of the biggest complaints during the course of the Xbox One generation was make single player games. Mm -hmm. We don't want all this co-op multiplayer games that you guys keep focusing on, which is, you know, kind of led to the demise of, uh, what's it called? Scalebound. It was in a completely different direction than what Microsoft wanted to take it in, where Platinum was taken and it just called a mismatch of all sorts of disaster. And now they seem kind of that focus of, we're going to make those single player games. We're going to counter what Sony develops in our own unique Microsoft way. And it does feel like Microsoft show is more of, we're showing you the promise of the future. Sony show was we're promising. We're showing you what's coming tomorrow. Microsoft is showing us what's coming next week. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we've seen E3 conferences from Sony, Nintendo and Microsoft where they show us games that are two, three years off but they were moments of hype. Yeah, Metroid, Metroid Prime 4 gets a it gets a title <laughs> thing, and people at N- yes. and Nintendo World Store in New York are losing their minds. I lost my mind, so yeah, I'm, I'm no one to speak. So yeah, I right. agree. And that's the thing. It's like, it's a gamble for Microsoft if they do want to sit there and they showcase Fable, and it's still, well, maybe two years off, but that hype, that initial wave of hype could just be enough to benefit or people saying, I'm buying that system at launch. I don't care if I have to wait two years. There's going to, Halo looks good. And I mean, that's the weird thing with hype. It's not rational. You lose your mind temporarily for that second, you buy into it, and then six months later, you say, I could have waited. Yeah, and rationality has actually been one of Microsoft's problems. I mean, you you described it really well there, where you uh, said they they got away from making for single player games. uh, and, And like the reason they did that is because Phil Spencer looked at the at the data. He looked at the telemetry and he saw the way people were spending time on on Destiny, and he's like, "I really like Destiny too." And that's like, if that's what people want, why are we making all the single player stuff that people buy and play over a weekend and then sell as a used game? The, you know, the, the weekend later, um, and, and all that is super rational. And it's just not how we work as as gaming fans and what we get excited about. Getting excited about that one game that we do play for. Uh, you know, uh, 15 hours over a weekend, uh, and then and then we don't play it again for you know years or years or, or whatever. We still like that. Those are the moments we remember. That's the stuff we want to talk about, and, and and it's the stuff that like uh becomes word of mouth. Where a lot of people who yes. I was saying this to a friend the other day, like people who play single player games love to talk about them on Twitter and 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 message boards and on the internet, and people that play multiplayer games like to spend money on multiplayer games. And like if you're a business person, the clear there's the clear answer there, but. It's just, it's so much more complicated than that. And getting people excited about those games and getting them to want to talk about your games on message boards actually is important, as as weird as that sounds. Yeah, like, I always think of Sony's, the E3 of Miracles, yeah. where it was Final Fantasy VII Remake, Shenmue Three, and The Last Guardian. Now, look at the quality of those three games. Did yeah. Shenmue Three live up to all that hype after such a long wait? And it just didn't matter, did it? Mm. It just didn't no. matter. Yeah, too much time like, had passed, really. Yeah, too much time had passed. Final Fantasy VII Remake lived up to it. We waited a long time to get it. And, and it, last, but if it hadn't, that's still that, that E3 moment yeah, it, was still so important. It's, right. it's so weird. And everyone looked at those three games and they're like, I have to buy a PlayStation 4 for those three games. And 
I mean, I liked The Last Guardian. I enjoyed what it delivered despite some of its mechanical flaws. And a lot of people thought it was, you know, it wasn't worth the wait. But it didn't matter at the end of the mm-hmm. day because everyone remembers that E3 conference for those three games. It doesn't matter the quality. And I mean, that's where if Microsoft comes out later this month and they show us games that are 2022, 2023, it may not matter. They got it, you excited. And Sony's like pulled away from this in, in some ways that's, you know, to me, I take that as um, they, they did actually find this very stressful trying to live up to those to, to those expectations. And, and the idea of like having a game like uh, The Last Guardian hanging over your head for however long uh, was <laughs> actually a real pain in the ass. And they don't want to do that going forward. And, and they don't think they need to. Um, uh, but it's, it's, I mean, to me, it still seemed like it worked so well. I don't know why they like don't just like suck it up and keep doing that kind of thing because it's what people want. Uh, and Microsoft could just step into that role if Sony's going to step back. And at, there's a there's a lot of potential there for them to like really, really kick off this generation strong if they're willing to say, "We are promising you a magnificent games for the next three to five years, and we're going to talk about them right now." And and here's why you have to get an Xbox. It, it, there's a yeah that they could really really kickstart this generation. Yeah, I mean, I'd say we're all hopeful that Microsoft does come out strong this month because competition is good in good in this industry. We want to see Microsoft do well. We want to see Sony do well. We want to see Nintendo do well. And Microsoft is, they just seem like that wild card. Every time you think they're going to go into like E3 and have a great show, they mess it up some way. And finally, under Phil Spencer right now at the Xbox Series X, they have that focus. They've been nailing their marketing message, except for that May presentation and you're hopeful that i mean he hyped it up saying i know what we have cooking i'm confident in july now show us halo show us why halo infinite is going to be that big moment for the franchise show us fables show us that resurrection of an old ip and bring it into new light on your next generation hardware just show us a lot of surprises sell us on game pass do all of this and set us up for the Xbox Series X launch later this year, where we're looking at and saying, I cannot wait to dive into that Xbox ecosystem. Because after the Xbox One, they have to do a lot to get us back on board. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. Do you think, um, I know I know, you know, pricing and, and Lockhart and all that is not going to be part of this show. Do you think <laughs> we'll get more, I'll say, another look at the Series X hardware r- rather than just what we've seen to date? Do you think they'll show any kind of, any part of the hardware that we haven't seen before? Maybe the back. I think they'll just show it in use, right? They'll just show people using it. Mm-hmm. I think they'll, they'll show uh, interface kind of stuff. I don't know if they'll show uh, physical hardware any deeper uh, than they have before. They might. Like it's always hard. like there might be a sizzle reel, quick trailer going over yeah. the system again, and maybe reveal some new stuff. Uh, but but yeah, I, I think they'll show it in use more than they have before. So how do you yeah. think they they pivot then into the August, the rumored August show where they actually show the hardware? You know, I mean, if this is all about games, is is the next show just all about hardware and no games? I mean, how do you think they they kind of sell that to to people? I think that when you get done with the show, if they don't if they don't tease the August event at the at the end of the show, uh, you know, they start saying, "Hey, in August, come back and we are going to lay out our entire strategy for you." Like we just talked about the games, we showed you the Xbox Series X already. You, you guys have a really good idea, but come back in August, sit down and watch, and we are going to run you through exactly what we're thinking. Price, release date, uh, you know, why, like, you know, maybe some surprise and like why there are two systems, who this other system is for. I think that's how they're going to position is like, this is us just explaining to you exactly what we're thinking and why and why we think this is good for you. Uh, you know, come and join us if you want. Buy an Xbox if you want. Play on PC if you want. Here's how Game Pass fits into all this stuff. Um, I, I think that's how they actually play that out. Yep. Yeah, that fits. Because, yeah, you can position the August as kind of like that pre-launch event. You give the price, the right. date. Pre-orders go live at the end of this thing, yes. Yeah. Right, yeah. You give that launch lineup or the you know launch window lineup. You detail some of the Game Pass stuff. And that's really all you need. You show a few surprises. Because, like, I remember back before the PlayStation 4 launched, Sony came out and they showed the teaser trailer for Uncharted 4. Like, yeah, it wasn't coming for a while, but it was just that nice, oh, we're about to launch our system. Let's show you something on the future. So if Microsoft does that, let's say that's where they show Perfect Dark mm-hmm. for the first time, just a little teaser trailer, even if it's just the logo, you just see. Yeah, just you know, or just like eyes opening up in a um, 
Yeah. And a, and a sizzle reel or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. You see Elvis and her pupil, like the original N64 box art or something. Yeah. And so a little tease like that and gets people like, ooh, like they just convinced me to buy it. I like the price. I like where they're going. Now they showed me something a little deeper into the future. And then they can show a full on trailer later in the year, like the game, the video game award show or even XO. If they can keep that momentum, you know, just moving forward, leading up to launch, they're probably in a good position. I mean, Sony's going to be there every step of the way. I mean, right now we're looking at Microsoft shows at the end of July, and it sounded like in the first half of August, here comes Sony with the state of play to talk about more of the PlayStation 5 and the rumored, you know, potentially maybe Silent Hill shows up. Oh, come so on. Just... Come on, Nate. Come, no, 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 <laughs> no. Konami. Do not, do ne- never bank on Konami to, to provide anything. No. You got to have faith. Oh. No. let's see that's where if sony's there every beat of the drum matching microsoft i mean we we're gonna have a really interesting lead up to these launches and it's such a different tale than what it was six months ago where it was like wow look at microsoft they went to the friggin' video game award show and they came out strong hellblade and the hardware and sony was like we're going to be quiet until June. And Microsoft is just like, we're going to show you backwards compatibility. We're going to show you SSD loading. We're going to talk about all this awesome stuff. And all that momentum shifted in June when Sony just absolutely killed their conference. And now it looks like maybe will Microsoft take the lead in marketing momentum come July 23rd? I think uh, they will They will sit side by side. Well, I'll put it that mm-hmm. way. And it's really up to Sony then to see what, what we have, what, what they have for us in the room in August day to play, whether that is enough. But I, I would say they're not going to overtake Sony, but I think they're, they're going to, they're going to be right there with them. Yeah, I think they're going to, I think that's right. I think they're going to get about as close as they can get. Uh, I think um, Microsoft overtaking Sony and in the momentum was never something I fully bought. Like it's like, yeah, they're talking to us right now, but we just as soon as Sony says anything, people are going to go wild, uh, and that's exactly how it played out. And I think that um, the way that you actually, the, the way this whole business works is, it's you're going to have to deliver consistently over years. Microsoft's going to have to come back in 2021 E3 time and have another great show with a, a, bu- a bunch more yes. games to surprise people. So uh, it's good that they're that they have a lot of studios. It's good that they're thinking about continuing to buy more studios. I, you know, I'm not sure how much I believe that Warner Brothers rumor. Uh, but but if they you know if they brought in ten more studios that's a lot like the, one of the problems is they they've always been outnumbered by Sony's uh, first party studios they've always like had Sony's had way more people working on games than Microsoft ever had in the last ten years or so um, just evening it up there uh, it, that could really draw, draw them closer but they're not going to overtake Sony until they actually like overtake Sony like they they have to actually prove it out it can't just yes. happen in the marketing game I know this is the perfect topic to end the discussion on. Do we see Microsoft introduce new studio acquisitions at the event? I don't think so. I, I thought about that before we, we, we started um, talking uh, just before. I don't think so. I, I don't feel like it's it's something that is going to happen. I'm, I, I kind of feel like if there was an acquisition, there'd be rumors about it. that Because, you know, those type of things are right. pretty hard to contain. So I, I don't think we'll, we'll hear about an acquisition. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's unlikely. Um, I, it's not out of the realm of possibility. It's definitely something that would continue to fit with what they're trying to say. Like we are, you know, we have all these games, and here are some studios that are going to make some more more games from from us. That that fits with what they're trying to do here, right? Um, but it, yeah, I just feel like they if if they are, actually are looking at WB, it's because they probably haven't made any acquisitions recently, and that's like something they're like, well, we've been saving this money. What are we going to spend it on? Well, I mean, we have to and go ask Satalia for a little bit more money, but we'll, we'll maybe we'll go do this instead. Uh, so yeah, I think I think the the MVG is right that if they, if they had done this, we probably would have started hearing, hearing about it. Right now, let's get to some of these Streamlab questions that I had come in. We had a five dollar donation from Jackson who asks. NBA 2K21 will be $70 on PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X, according to GameIndustry.biz. Will this pricing model be seen with other games that aren't cross-gen, such as NBA, or will it be exclusive to sm- to a smaller amount of games? Ooh, I think, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know, man, how this one's going to play out. Like, I feel like th- part of me feels like the publishers are going to dip their toes in the water and see how it feels, what the temperature feels like, and... If if it if it goes well, they'll just continue. If not, they'll kind of pull it back. 
That's what I think. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Like they, they uh, they're going to try. Like uh, they're going to yeah. try. They, they this. Um, I think um, a lot of people talk about this in a, in a way that doesn't it doesn't jive with how these decisions actually get made. Um, I, I get why people want to bring up the inflation thing. It's something that I think about too. They haven't raised prices in a long time, and infl- inflation would like if inflation if prices went up with inflation, it would be eighty five dollars or whatever. Um, and well, then why wasn't it eighty five dollars? It's because like you're selling to people, and people know what they expect to pay for something. And uh, and if if you're talking about it from like a, a point of view of psychology. Um, we are putting a lot of money into the system right now because of COVID. Uh, we, we are, we're, you know, they're actually literally trying to print money to pay for stuff, and that's going to potentially lead to inflation. We could also have deflation because so many people are out of jobs. Like we're in a really precarious point in our, in our economy right now. But the publishers are betting that we are going to get pretty significant inflation just because of so much money being in the system. And, you're, and I know a lot of people are going to say a lot of people did lose their jobs. Why would they ever think about raising prices in a, in a situation where so many people are out of work? And the truth is just they're not no one's going to be selling consoles to anyone who's out of work for the first couple of years like that's these systems are going to be expensive they're going to be selling to people who have the money to spend and those are the people that would also be likely to be able to spend 70 dollars on a game especially when there's no movies and no going out still and 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 theaters are closed like people still these people that are going to be buying consoles are still going to have an entertainment budget and if they have more money sitting there Spending seventy dollars on a game, like the, the the difference between sixty and seventy, is is very small at that point, and it's and it's going to be easy to get, easier to get that by now than it ever has been. Uh, so I I think they're going to try, and if it does backfire, they can always go back to sixty. Um, and, and but a lot of people are interested in raising prices. A lot of people have a lot of stake in getting you know that lifetime value bump, bumped up. And if anyone's thinking no, fewer microtransactions, don't be a crazy person. That's not going to happen either. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think the publishers will try. If the market rejects the seventy dollars price, they're going to go back to that fifty nine ninety nine price point because the reason games are sixty dollars right now is because that's what the market is willing to spend. Yep. And I mean, it basically just comes to that: if no one's willing to spend seventy dollars, they're not going to charge seventy dollars. Yeah, but I, I bet a lot of people are going to be just fine paying seventy dollars. So yeah, once if you force it to become the standard and we don't have a choice, then it's going to yep. be seventy dollars. But it's definitely something to, hey, maybe Microsoft comes out on the 23rd and says all of our first party games are going to be $60 on Xbox Series X. Yeah, be... or, or maybe they say NBA 2K is $70, bu- $70 yeah. but we made a deal and you can get it on Game Pass. Like, yep. yeah. again, like that seems the kind of thing they would try to try to pull. And they're like, yeah, of course you guys can make your game $70. <laughs> but let's talk. Let's talk. Let's see what we can make happen. And then we had a $10 donation from Zombie Porin, who says, hey, guys, love the show. You'll probably already cover this, but what are your expectations for Halo Infinite? Do you expect <laughs> it to be a true return to form, something on par with Gears 5, or Halo 5 Part 2? I'm cautiously optimistic, but not super hyped. Return to form. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that it's going to be, uh, you know, they're not going to just make Destiny, but I think they are going to try to find a way to make their their kind of take on, on, on not, not, not even their take, their idea where this is a game that you are going to be playing longer, even if you're sort of just playing, you know, PVE sort of content. Um, I, I think that they're going to put a lot of emphasis on that. At least that's my my expectation. Um, and I think it makes sense. Yeah. I think they want they want to make the Halo that you will be playing for years, whether you are a multiplayer competitive person or or the kind of person that just wants to play through the campaign. Yeah, I would agree with that. And then we had a three dollar donation from Matthew Hammond, who asked. The three of you last week came to the conclusion that there were no one last thing games in 2020 besides the one we already know. I am proposing that Nintendo announces the 2D Metroid, Metroid Prime Trilogy, and (laughs) Oracle of Seasons and or Oracle of Ages remake. (laughs) Now, I said there was one more thing. I said there was one more thing for 2020 from Nintendo. (laughs) I don't think it's any of those three, though. I, I like it. I would be happy with that stuff for sure. Yeah, yeah that'd be a hell of a three games. But as we know now, there is talk of a direct possibly coming the week of July 20th. So if there is that one more thing moment, maybe we get it there or maybe the direct happens and it's everything we've already talked about, like Pikmin 3, a 3D Mario collection and 3D World. And we still sit there saying, well, that wasn't worth a direct. It's a Nintendo Oof. Land 2. Oh, dear. All right. 
Yeah. Fireworks. I'm in. <laughs> Theme parks are closed, but you can come to Nintendo Land 2 right now. That's good marketing, actually. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had a $5 donation from Skittles, who says, You're Phil Spencer. On top of your own exclusives you're launching this holiday, you want to pay a third-party developer for day one rights to a game on Game Pass to sweeten the Xbox Series X pie. What game do you choose and why? Cyberpunk. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's yeah. the obvious choice, right? I think Cyberpunk is, is there, but I'm uh, now that I'm thinking about it, NBA makes a ton of, like, that game sells so well, and if you're trying to, like, woo, like, a, a group of people to your system, to your next gen system over the other one. Um, That's big. Man, given them, given the people that buy an NBA every year, like that game, uh, I don't know that to me, that's, and then, you know, you know, they spend on microtransactions too. So mm-hmm. yep. yeah, I don't know. I think, I think you're probably right. Cyberpunk is, is the obvious one, but man, Call, I, I Call of Duty could be another one. You could, you could, you could sure. argue for, you got oh, Call of Duty day one. On, on for the same though. reasons, yeah, yeah. Call of Duty's tough though because if Microsoft, if Sony still has that exclusive marketing deal, even with this DLC map packs, would you really give Microsoft the Game Pass version? Would that kind of hurt Sony in a way? Yeah, <laughs> but That's a good point. Man, game the Game Pass idea moving forward, if they do have something like Cyberpunk at launch, it can be such a strong platform for Sony or for Microsoft this gen. Uh, and then we had three dollars from Diane Alistair, who says, "You got to contact Amazon. They are depriving the world of the Nate the Hate Animal Crossing ASMR. <laughs> that they are. Hey man, make the channel. <laughs> I was going to, then I never got my copy. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Amazon. Thanks, Bezos. <laughs> then we had a twenty dollars donation from Noah Sanchez, who says, "Hey Nate, always love hearing the great marketing insights. My question." Xbox has 15 diverse studio developing games, but beyond Halo and Gears, can they now deliver more quality narrative driven games like The Last of Us to truly compete with Sony's PlayStation 5 output? That's why they have the initiative. That's why they've been buying up these studios like Obsidian. I don't know if we'll quite hit that caliber of like a naughty dog with these, but I mean, the initiative is made up of former Naughty Dog and Santa Monica and Sony Santa Monica employees. So Microsoft does seem like they want to build towards that level of output. But I mean, we probably won't see it until halfway through this generation. Yeah, yeah. they have to actually prove that that's what they want to do. Like I'm just buying studios is not what that is, does not mean anything. You have to like fund those studios and give them the time and be willing to deal with long delays. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, Microsoft is, is again, they very much based on, on data and looking at, at the way people are playing games and, and they, they're going to continue thinking that I, I think there's always going to be that lingering thing in Phil's head where we could just make something more like destiny or more like Minecraft and get people playing for a long time. And doesn't that make more sense? Um, so it will. So now is the time to prove that they they bought into this idea that uh, having these big Sony like single player experiences on Game Pass is going to help Game Pass. And if they believe that, that's the actual counter here. So uh, I don't know. I, I'm I'm not convinced yet, but I'm I'm willing to be if if they're going to show us a, 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 at this event. Right. It does seem like they're still putting them down that building blocks. They're building towards it, but whether or not they get there remains to be known. But they are moving in the right direction. It might just take a little longer than some fans are willing to wait for them to get there, but you can be hopeful. Then we had a $5 donation from Blake who says, love the show. Any sort of validity to the July 13th PlayStation 5 price reveal, release date, and pre-order rumor? Thanks. I don't believe so. No, it's August. Yeah, I don't see any reason for Sony to come out this month, especially like July 13th and price and give a launch date to the PlayStation 5, especially with an August state of play planned. If they want to do it, they can do it then. And even yeah. then they can wait till, they can still wait till September to really date and price these you know, systems. They don't have to do it right now, but I would probably bet a little bit on them pricing it come the August state of play. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think they want to start opening up pre-orders around August and, mm-hmm. and getting a good feel for how many people are going to buy this thing. I think September maybe they could do, but you're starting to get to that that kind of no man's land point where it's it's a little trickier, you know. Um, yeah. Yep. 
to gauge the number I of think, sales and stuff. Yeah, and I think like I mean, yeah, you're, you're, th at that point you're messing around with like you know shipping yep. issues and and like getting stuff into like retail sure. channels and 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 you know as much as we know that they are go probably going to sell every single play PlayStation Five that they make uh, through the first six months or, or whatever. Um, they still don't know how people are feeling about spending money in a, in, a, in this world, you know, especially in the United States where COVID-19 is just not going to go away. So, you know, they're, they're going to have to, they're going to have to have numbers and they're going to have to re make sure retailers feel real comfortable about bringing stuff into their, into their warehouses. Um, and August is probably about the, the, the latest they can go reasonably. Um, and it's also the earliest that they would want to go because they're just, you know, the difference between July and August actually isn't that much. The difference between August and September is starting to feel pretty, pretty big in terms of what, like the data and, and actually getting pre-orders out there. Right. And then we had a final $5 donation from Blake who says, where will you pre-order next gen consoles? I'm thinking pre-order at Amazon and GameStop just to be safe in case something goes wrong. That's probably the best plan anyone can do. Whoever can guarantee kind of day one delivery, because Amazon has yeah. been a little all over the place, and not not it's not their fault. I mean, obviously COVID has had an impact, but sometimes they can't commit to getting getting in the system on on the first day. So, whatever it makes the most sense, really. I have, I have no allegiances really with with anyone, but whoever can get me a console fastest, <laughs> I'm going to go with honestly. Yeah, I haven't really thought about it much. So, uh, but I mean, I guess Sony did just open up their like sony store online right maybe i'll have to see what they're saying about that if that's like if they're guaranteeing day one i uh I'll, and same with microsoft i'll probably do microsoft store and then maybe amazon just to, you know, yeah. to make sure i'll probably look around to see who has who can promise launch day because i pre-ordered my playstation 4 from amazon way you know back in june right after they put up the pre-orders and launch day comes my system still hadn't shipped I contacted Amazon customer support and said, hey, uh, how come it didn't ship? And they told me, we don't ship these until they come out. And I said, but other people got them today. And they said, no, they didn't. I said, I can show you people online. They, they're showing their Amazon box with their PlayStation 4. And the rep fought me and said, that's impossible. I said, OK, because <laughs> you did have on your website guaranteed launch day delivery. And eventually, they're like, well, we can ship it you know, sometime next week. I'm like, what do you mean next week? They're like, well, we don't know our stock. I said, I pre-ordered it from you. And then later that day, they were taking more orders for the PlayStation 4 that if you ordered it that day, you could have it overnighted to you on Saturday. So I contacted the rep again. I said, I've ordered this thing four months ago. How come I can't have mine here tomorrow? And they're like, okay, you know, we'll change your shipping and have it there on Saturday for you. And I was like, you know what? I'm never pre-ordering a console from you again, unless you can promise me launch day. So that was a headache, but I'm... I'm dumb enough to probably pre-order again from Amazon because they don't charge you until it ships. That's so true. it's kind of a nice fallback option. And that does it for all the Streamlab donations. As always, if you make a, if you want to help support the channel, you can make a donation to Streamlabs. You can find a link to that in the description on YouTube. If you donate a dollar or any amount, you can ask us a question. We will answer at the end of the episode. If you donate a hundred dollars or more, we will dedicate the episode to you. We did not have a dedication today. And that will conclude it. That will conclude today's episode. Thank you for joining me once again, MVG. Always a pleasure. And thank you for joining us once again, Jeff. I loved it. Great time. It's always fun to have you here. Yeah, thanks, man. And I want to thank Rand for joining us. I believe he had to step away. Something came up. Uh, we'll, we'll get him back uh, after the uh, yeah. the event. Yeah, we'll have him back after the we'll, we'll do a, we'll Yeah, do a, I'd love to hear what he thought. We'll do a yeah, post mortem sure. on, on the show. <laughs> And you can find links to VentureBee and Jeff's Twitter in the description below, as well as the Twitter account for MVG and Rand's YouTube and Twitter account in the description below. And be sure to like the video and subscribe. Let us know your thoughts on the Xbox July event in the comments section. We do read all the comments. And until next time, continue to embrace the hate.